All right. So first off, Rich, I'm so excited to have you on. I, uh, I, I've been going back and forth with you on videos since like 2019 with hitting, and then you stopped by the facility back then and worked with some of our guys. So I appreciate you being on with me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for offering a facility for Aaron to work. Yeah, yeah. That was exciting going and watching you actually work with him. I'm just so used to just seeing the videos of you being with him. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting with someone like you watching me work with Aaron or anybody watching me work with Aaron, they really miss the good stuff because the good stuff we did eight years ago. Yeah. And now we just kind of look at each other and we know what, you know, if I ask him to do something or do you have this feeling, yeah, I've got it. We don't have to work on it. Or yeah, whatever. it's just like fine tuning. So if stuff. a brand new person watched me work with Aaron, he wouldn't think we're doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> because he didn't see the early days. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So today, my thought is if everybody has already seen um, everything about the swing, like we, we were talking yesterday and we mentioned um, providing value to the audience, like how can we actually do that? and give them something that they haven't seen regarding yeah. the swing. And uh, you mentioned all, all they got to do is look us up and they can find everything on there. Yeah. So what I wanted to do on this podcast instead was ask you some other questions. And so that way the people can really know you, who you are, and uh, more about what you stand for. So my first question for you is actually about your social media presence. Okay. It's because it's a little controversial. Yeah. Um, you get a lot of hate. I think you are number one <laughs> in hitting coaches for how much hate you actually get. Okay. online and you dish it right back and I respect the hell out of it but um, a lot of people don't see why it's like a necessity so if you could talk a little bit about that and kind of let okay. people know uh, it kind of goes back to when I first started trying to learn and I fell for something called PCR posture connection rotation with Steve Englishby and Paul Nyman and I started promoting that online and was teaching it to my son and I was getting hate even then when I was teaching someone else's stuff. And little by little, I realized that what I was teaching my son, that stuff wasn't working. And my son would tell me, Dad, I just don't think this works. And I'd say, you're just not doing it right. Keep trying it. And I would do that over and over. And pretty soon, his team was a player short one night, and I filled in. I was, I don't know, 50-some years old. <laughs> And I, I'm going to do, I'm going to show my son what he's supposed to be doing. And I knew instantly it didn't work against a live arm. Yeah. And I've been teaching it. Okay. So um, shortly thereafter, I had my aha moment and started teaching it. And I took a lot of hate for changing. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think change is bad when you're changing for the better. I've already done my mea culpa and apologized to what I was teaching wrong. And now I have something that I absolutely know is the best thing out there. Yeah. If there's something better, no one has ever introduced it yet. Yeah. And this is so good that I feel an obligation and a moral responsibility to make sure it gets out there. And in the process of doing that, I receive a lot of hate. And um, I grew up in a pool hall. I owned Teacher's Billiards and Sports Cafe for 34 years. That's the teacher man. The right? teacher that's man. That's where that uh, uh, name came from. Yep. And in the pool hall, bullshit doesn't fly. If you're trying to pull something over on somebody and, and it's uh, found out that it's not truthful or you're just talking out of your ass, yep. you're going to get ridiculed big time. So I grew up in an environment where this give and take was nonstop and only the truth prevailed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in a situation now where I believe I have truth, and a lot of people don't believe it. And I'm not afraid to stand up for it and fight for it because I have felt something that I have never felt before when I played. I've taught it to people who tell me the same thing, that, that the first time they feel it, they said, this has to be right. I mean, I may not be able to duplicate it tomorrow or next week, but I felt something I've never felt before, and it's wonderful. So. Um, I welcome the, the fight. I wish we would all get in the same room or the same cage and duke it out. Be and, willing to learn And it. be willing to learn and come to a decision. And, yeah. and I think every hitter in the history of the world or the future would, would benefit from it. Yeah. Uh, I happen to believe that my stuff would prevail. But if someone can show me something that's better than my stuff, I will, I will adopt it and teach it. I don't think it's possible. But if well, it happens, I will teach it. It's interesting because most of the guys in the league right now, everybody claims to be open-minded, but very few are willing to actually yeah. dive into this and, yeah. and really cover it, which kind of leads me into my next question is, 
why don't you think that an MLB org has really invested into this? And why don't they have some HLP instructors in there? Because the next generation of hitters, they're already doing this. Yeah. Like they get access to all this information online. They already see that it's out there. They want to learn how to turn the barrel. They want to learn how to stay rear legged. Like they know these cues. Yeah. And so it's a matter of time before, you know, they clash heads if they're not already clashing heads right now with yeah, some of the hitting I, instructors. I, I, I think work. the, uh, the wave is coming. It's going to happen. Um, so many players are interested in it and doing it and trying it, and many of them are having success. But from a coaching or an organization standpoint, um, I think they're afraid to ruin people. Yeah. I think they're afraid that, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've drafted this athlete here in, in a high round, and we want him to be good, and he should be good, and we're afraid that if we change what he's doing, it will make him worse. Yeah. And no one wants to do that to anybody, nobody. Yeah. You know, all, everybody has good intentions. Um, so I think they're reluctant to adopt it, um, but very much so, until they feel it, they don't believe it. They got to swing a they bat. They got to swing a bat. And, Absolutely. and you and I and a few of the HLP guys are the only ones I ever see swinging a bat on social media. Yeah. And we feel something. And we know that feeling is special. Well, I notice even with just me, I started facing live at bats in here against some of the pro guys. I haven't swung in seven years, and I immediately lost it. I didn't have it. Yeah. But me starting to swing a bat more often than just some demos here and there. Like, we, we do train a lot of big groups, and I don't have all the time in my hands to constantly hit with them. Um, but me just starting to swing a bat more made me a much better coach yeah. in that process. But right now, most of the guys are just coaching behind a laptop. Data-driven mm -hmm. is, is the big thing. Exit velo and bat speed. How do you feel about that? Um, those metrics are, I guess, important. I mean, they tell you something. Yeah. Um, but they're not the difference maker. The minor leagues are filled with guys that triple A, double A that can hit 300 and hit a lot of home runs and they have a good EV and they have a good launch angle. But when they get to the big leagues, they, they don't make it. Yeah. Uh, the difference maker is launch quickness. It's uh, if you, what good is exit velocity if you can't hit the ball, yeah. if you can't hit it consistently. And you, with the quality of pitching that exists today, you have to be super quick to be able to deal with the, the, they uh, give you. Yeah. And so launch quickness, in my opinion, is the difference maker. Now, if you have launch quickness, you also need to be strong enough to hit the ball hard. Uh, you also need to hit the ball in the air. So there's nothing wrong with launch angle and exit velocity, except when that when you think those are the difference maker. Yeah. And for the audience, can you explain what launch quickness really is? Okay. Launch quickness is the time between your decision to swing and the launch. It has to be instantaneous. You can't have to decide and then move to another spot and then swing. You have to, when you decide, you have to swing. You have to be at your loaded launch position under control so that there's no time between your decision and launch. Yeah. I say no time. There's a fraction of a second. Yeah. It has to be but a very a small time. fraction of a yeah. second. And so when you're training EV and, and launch angle, it's mostly weight room, strength and conditioning stuff, which is fine. And a guy will hit uh, more balls harder in a cage, but he doesn't hit more balls harder in a game because he doesn't have the quickness to deal with the fastball or the off-speed or the slider or the moving pitches. Mm -hmm. okay? That was probably one of the biggest struggles in my career. I could hit the ball a ton. I just didn't hit it very often. Yeah. Would you say that was probably the biggest change for Aaron? Yes, uh, absolutely. In, I think it was 2017, right? Absolutely. I saw a scouting report on him uh, when he was at Fresno State that um, big guy with a lot of power, but he's not hitting many homers. Mm -hmm. Impressive in BP, but not many homers in games. Story of my life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so um, when I met him, he had hit 179 with the uh, Yankees the previous year. He got called up in September. He did have four homers, but he struck out uh, 42 out of 84 at bats. So he's clearly got a quickness problem. If he can't, if he's striking out that much, he has a quickness problem. When he hits the ball, it goes a long ways, but he doesn't hit it very often. Yeah. And so launch quickness is the big difference in him, and he'll tell you that. Yeah. Okay? Well, what's funny is most people actually say that if you're, it only works if you're six seven and two hundred eighty yeah. pounds. Yeah. Um, but for me, actually, I've been doing this swing now for the better part of like six seven years now with a lot of athletes, hundreds if yeah. not thousands of athletes now, and um, I've seen that it's actually harder from my point of view to get a bigger guy to do this because they can get away with a lot more. Yeah. Because they have all the exit velo and all the bat speed and they can impress in BP and things like that, they think mm -hmm. that it's working, but until they get exposed in a game yeah. where they start facing higher-level competition. One of the things I say almost every time I'm with Aaron is Aaron's about quickness, not power. Yeah. 
but because he's 6'7", 280, he's got built-in power. Yeah. So if he has the quickness and barrels the ball, it's going to go a long ways. Mm -hmm. A guy who's 5'9", 180, he's going to, he needs to barrel balls too. Yeah. They just aren't going to go as far. They're not going to go over the fence as often. Mm -hmm. But if he gets them in the gap, he's got doubles and occasional home run. He's, he's reaching his potential. Exactly. So uh, now Kerry Carpenter. Yeah. Yeah, he's a different story. He's not 6'7", 280, no. and it's working great for him. 6'2", 200, 220, I think. Just an average yeah. citizen. If yeah. you look at Kerry, you don't think he's – Super athlete. You don't think he's super big, super strong. Uh, he, he, you know, I'm not saying he's not strong, but he, you don't see the strength you see when yeah. you look at Aaron. Yeah. And yet he hit 30 bombs in uh, in the minor leagues in 2022, and over his last 162 big league seasons or big league games over two seasons, mm -hmm. he's hit 30 bombs again in the big leagues. Yeah. And when he was on ESPN talking about trying to keep his head over his back foot, swinging yeah. at release, purposely trying to miss, and all these drills that you came up with. Um, I thought it was fascinating. And in that moment, I was like, all right, more people are going to start gravitating towards yeah. this. More people in the league will start gravitating towards this. But they didn't. Yeah, More I'd... people did. More high school players, college players, other professional athletes. Like, they, they're the tsunami's coming. They're yeah. doing it. Yeah. But yet the leagues are still falling behind. Yeah, it's interesting how um, I'm a teacher. I graduated from college as a teacher, and I taught high school for three years. And when I opened my billiard room, I taught – billiards for, for, all, for a long time, and I just like to teach, okay? And so when I started teaching hitting and had some success with players and started posting the information on the social media, I would show the drills that I was using to teach the swing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit the drills are a little unusual. Yeah, that's what I they, thought when I first they, started. They isolate a segment of the swing, and there's, I don't know, three or four or five or six drills that isolate different segments. And when you look at just that isolated segment, that looks weird. Yeah. And this second segment, that looks weird. And this third segment, that looks weird. But when you get them to do all those segments at one time, it re results in a very fine-looking swing that plays. Yeah, yeah. And, that's... and so they criticize the drills, but they love the swing. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that happens all the time. Yeah. Um, I actually have to hide players because they're doing this swing. They're yeah. doing the swing in the orgs. They're doing the swing at their college but the coaches don't like how it looks until yeah. they're actually performing. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, I'm going to leave you alone now that you're yeah. doing well. So. Aaron has told me the first day he went to uh, the Yankee spring training after working with me and started doing the drills, the hitting coach come up to him and asked him to stop. That, that That's not going to work. It, it, you know, you can't do that. Yeah. Well, Aaron stuck with it and continued to do the drills and look what's I'd happened. I'd say it's paid off. Yeah, I think it's paid off. Yeah, it's paid off for a lot of other people too. Um, one of the issues that I see with a lot of players – is not being ready at release. So you talked about launch quickness, the mm -hmm. time between your decision to launch and the actual launch of your swing. But can you talk a little bit more about being ready at release and why that's yeah. so important? Okay. Um, it's my opinion that as I watch big league games, and this was true with my son, um, they literally aren't ready to swing the moment they decide to swing. Yeah. So that's launch quickness. If you, if, you, if you are ready to swing the moment you decide to swing, you have launch quickness. So these hitters that I see... Um, they decide to swing and then they load a little more or then they put their foot down or then they just move their hands a little bit and then they swing. And that in that period of time, when you do that extra move between your decision and your launch, the ball moves. It either it's, If it's a fastball, it gets on you. If it's a slider, it moves. If it's a change up, it, it, it doesn't get to you. And you have to be able to, to be your best. You have to be able to wait for the ball. And when you're waiting for the ball and processing the speed and the spin and everything and are super quick, it feels like when you're right, it feels like you're waiting for the fastball. Yeah. And then when you're waiting for the fastball, it's not that all that hard to wait a little longer for the off-speed pitch when you can control the difference between your decision and your launch. Well, that's where swing and release comes in. When you can learn to swing the bat at pitch release – you're actually able to swing the bat at pitch release by swinging at pitch release in your practice. Yeah. And then in a game, you get to that same position. You're at your launch position a long period of time. Now, you may be stretching it some. You're not standing there like a statue, but you are at your launch position. Now you can wait for everything that comes out of the pitcher's hand. Yeah, now you have and, the ability to swing. Yeah, to release. And, and if you're not waiting, you're rushing. And when you have to rush for the fastball, when they're throwing 95, 98, 100 miles an hour, eventually you have to cheat a little bit. Yeah. 
But and right then, now, most people are actually just throwing them in front of velo machines, thinking that's going to be the fix. Yeah, yeah. And I think it causes more chaos, more yes. harm than it does good. Yes. Um, it's the cart before the horse. Yeah. When they're chasing, when you're facing chaos before you've learned to control your swing at release launch position, it's a nightmare. What's one of the drills that you do to control that like reaction times? So that way okay. you can build that reaction time with them. Instead of the velo machine work, what is it? Okay. Well, first of all, that instant launch quickness comes from a rearward snap of the barrel. This rearward snap of the barrel will always be forever in time quicker than a forward push of the barrel. Yeah. Always. So if you have the rearward snap ready, okay, and 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 you decide to swing, you snap, you're there. You're, you have your quickness. What was the question now? Um, what is one of the drills that you the do drills. for okay. the reaction? So first of all, you have to have the hands primed and ready to turn the barrel over. Second of all, you have to have a one-legged coil that's underneath the hand snap. Um, there's there's some carryover. The hand snap I like to talk about is the quickness and the release of the leg is the power. Yeah. Although the, the properly loaded leg also gives you quickness. Yeah. Okay. Together, when you have the hands primed to snap the bat and the torso tilts with it over the back of the leg, the leg unwinds instantly. And when the leg unwinds instantly, the bat snaps through the zone with tremendous suddenness. Yeah. So I have some one-legged drills. I have some hand snap drills. I have a lot of drills to get the hitter to understand how to snap the hands and how to coil and stretch and twist his rear leg so that when the snap and tilt happens, the rear leg bursts. I've seen one of the drills on your social media, and I started doing it here, and it completely changed the game for us, where you put the machine up really close. Yeah. It's like 30, 40 feet, if mm -hmm. that. I, I'm 16 feet from it and throwing 30 miles an hour. 16 feet. 16 feet. Wow, yeah, we haven't done that. Yeah, yeah. ours is usually about 30 feet, and then yeah. we have it at like 55. Yeah, similar. Yeah, similar. That's okay. Uh, but that reaction time is way more important than just throwing them against Vila machine work yeah. and having them try to push and get good at hitting the machine. At my drill, 16 feet away, 32 miles an hour, that is equivalent to 110 mile an hour reaction time. Yeah. Now, the ball's not coming through the zone 110. I'm not telling you you can hit 110-mile-an-hour fastball if you can do my drill. Yeah. But you're, the time the machine releases the ball and it gets to you 16 feet away is the same amount of time that a pitcher throwing 110 from 55 feet gets to home plate. Yeah. It's the same amount of time. Yeah. So you have to learn, you work on your reaction time, your quickness. Yeah, and that's the huge. And then I do a drill where... I delay putting the ball in the machine. I've seen that one. And, then and you so hold you've got a fastball off speed drill. Yeah. And, and that's, this is the best drill I've ever come up with. Um, I believe, I've never worked with Aaron on that drill. Mm -hmm. I believe if I ever get him to my place or some place where we have this set up, mm -hmm. he'll get even better. Yeah, because he'll be able to <laughs> he'll learn. He'll learn. It, it, awesome. It's the greatest workout you can have yeah. where you can hit the crap out of the fastball and you can wait a tick later and hit the crap out of the off speed and you don't know which one's coming. I've actually done that drill, not at the 16 feet, but yeah. at ours, and uh, it exposes you. Oh, yeah. If you can't hold the rear leg, if you're not at the brink, if you're not ready at release, it yeah. exposes you. I've got really. a minor league Yankee now at AAA. I, I'm real sure he'll be a big leaguer. Yeah. He's a master at this drill, yeah. and he talks about how that drill has helped him uh, in his game. Yeah. How do you feel um, when coaches are negative towards the player, um, even if they're performing well, they're negative towards the player, and a player comes up to you and he's like, hey, my coach says, like, he doesn't want me doing the swing. How do I get around it? What are some stuff that you tell the player? Ooh. He's having success and the coach is still having, negative. Yes, yeah. That's a tough one. It's Because it, the ego's in the way at that point. Yeah, I, right? I hear it mostly when the, the player's struggling a little bit and the coach wants him to abandon what I'm teaching him and do what the coach wants. I don't like mm -hmm. that situation either. Yeah. Uh, I still believe what I'm teaching is the best way and that once he gets it, the coach will be happy. Yeah. But in the, in the scenario you're talking about where he's actually having success and the coach wants him to stop, um, what level is this? Is this high school ball? High school, I've had it high school, college. I haven't had it in the professional. Usually at okay. the professional level, they get out of the way once you're doing well. Yeah. Um, but high school and college, I think it's more of an ego thing. Yeah. It, coaches. Like you're not doing what I say. Yeah. You just, to do. the Your player swing doesn't look like how I want it to look. The player needs to sit down with the coach and have a yeah. heart to heart. And he needs to say, look, I really like what I'm doing. It feels good. I'm having success. I don't see a need to change. Um, ask the coach why he thinks. I need to change, and um, the coach is going to – I don't know what he's going to say, but he's probably going to say that you'll be better if you change, and I don't believe that's true. Yeah. So it might be time to find a new place to play. Yeah. I mean, seriously. I mean, 
it, it makes no sense. If I'm a high school co coach or a college coach and I've got 15 or 30 kids getting private instruction, I would be thrilled. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't be acting against it. Yeah. I don't have the time yeah. to work with all 15 kids as much as I worked with my son yeah. or as much as I worked with Aaron Judge. Absolutely. There's not enough time in the day for that. So if all my kids are out getting instruction, even if I don't, don't necessarily agree with it, yeah. and they're having successful, my job is to just to put a winning team on the field, not to steer a guy on, on his technique. Yeah, but most of these coaches are used to seeing – all the old school cues and the old school thing. Even yeah. right now, you get A Rod on ESPN. He's yeah. talking about you know knob straight down to the ball, yeah. front foot down early. Yet you watch his game swing, yeah. and it looks nothing like that. And so they're used to that. And if the coach, if the kid doesn't look like that, then the coach immediately he gets his ego hurt. Yeah, I, uh, I've said this many times. As I was studying, I would listen to them and try to do exactly what they said. And when I did exactly what they said, I never looked like them. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. And yeah. so I stopped listening and just started watching, and I'm just going to try to do what I see them do rather than what they said they did. Exactly. And I started feeling something new. Yeah. So. I mean, I can talk a little bit about my experience. When I started, I actually didn't think any of these drills were going to work. Yeah. You know, I got referred to go watch you um, from the director of hitting, actually, at Driveline way back in, like, 2016. That was news to me. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I think I was just annoying, annoying him a little bit because <laughs> I was very detail-oriented in all my stuff. You know, I was... You were in the hunt. Yeah, I was obsessing about my throwing development, my hitting development, my strength training. I was just curious about everything. And, um, you know, in that day and age, it was more important to collect the data and coach behind a laptop than it was to, like, get up, swing a bat, and show you these yeah. things. So what I was getting handed to me, and it wasn't just with them, it was with anybody that I was working with, it was you know, let's hit these numbers and then you should be a better hitter. And then I hit those numbers and then I wasn't a better hitter. I just hit the ball hard. You know, yeah. I was a big, strong kid, like, yeah. you know, but um, that never left me. That was where my strengths were. It was the technique to actually be efficient yeah. um, that led me that way. And so as I started to figure this out, I was like, I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm just going to test all this stuff, all these drills, and I'm going to either prove this wrong or prove it right, one or the other, but I'm going to mm -hmm. figure it out. And months went by and, um, I could have sped that up if I just would have paid to play and actually came over to your place and worked with you, right? But I was just sending DMs to everybody yeah. and um, trying to figure it out, trying to take the free route, penny pinching on my training. And then when I did start to feel something, I was like, oh, no, like, this is it. I'm stuck now. Like, yeah. I have to figure this out. And so more months went by. Um, at the time, I was posting a lot of free content online. So I was just getting people in for free, trying to figure out what works, what was the best method. You try this, you try this drill, you know. And then as other athletes started to improve and I started to improve, it was already at the end of my career. It was, it was yeah. too late for me. Um, but I immediately just stopped playing and started coaching all of them. And I was like, all right, you guys are test dummies now. We're going to figure this out. And then a year goes by and a bunch of no names start going into college. Guys that had no business playing in college baseball a couple years before, and now they're headed there. And then, you know, a few hundred athletes later, and I'm like, this, this definitely is the way more people need to know about mm -hmm. it. So um, I will say at first, I was open-minded to considering it, but I was closed-minded in how I thought about the process. I was like, well, I'm just going to kind of prove them wrong. Yeah. And then as time went on, I proved you right. And um, I realized like that is what being open-minded actually is. It's actually doing the scientific method of like testing, trial mm -hmm. and error, experimenting for a long period of time with a large population of athletes, and then taking out what doesn't work and putting in what does. Yep. You know? And I wish more people would actually do that. Yeah, when you coach behind a laptop, and you, uh, you say, get these numbers, and you get those numbers, and you're still no better. Yeah. And the coach can't help you get better. Mm -hmm. That's it's like, well, I hit it this hard at this launch angle. I should be good. But yeah. then you go out and you have the same season you did before. Yeah. Yeah, it should I be eye-opening. I still eye hit 200 and, and not very many homers. Yeah. Um, those numbers, I'm not saying they're not important, mm -hmm. but they're not the difference maker. Exactly. LQ is the difference maker. Launch quickness is the difference maker. And you actually just came out with an app, right? Yep. yep. And it measures LQ, yep. right? Yep. Very good. Do you, do you want to talk a little about bit it. about that? Yeah. The uh, um, you're gonna you're gonna be your best when you can be ready to swing the bat at release. And by the way, I mean actually able to swing the bat at release, not ready to get ready. You could actually snap the bat at pitch release. When you're in that position. And then you learn to hold that feeling, that readiness. Hold's a tough word because hold kind of makes it feel like you're just stationary. Yeah. You're not stationary when you're holding that position. You're still stretching it. 
but you're in a position where you could swing at pitch release or you can swing when the ball gets there. You have this window of time that you're totally under control, and you can just swing when the ball gets there. Yeah. And that's what the app teaches. Um, you'll get a, a reading. Well, you, you should when Using the app, you should first start by swinging at pitch release and get that the best reading you can, and it should be under .1. Uh, I, I've got several numbers like 0 .5, 0.05, or 0 .09, or something like that. Yep. For a guy my age, that's pretty good, but it's pretty easy to do because you can time the perfect release. If you can't, if you're on deck, and you can't swing the moment the pitcher releases the ball, which is a finite, definite point in time, yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, I mean, if you can't do that, how do you expect to hit a moving ball? Exactly. So anyway, you get to that position, and then you learn to hold it for the ball. And now I promise you, you'll be the best hitter you can be. Mm -hmm. Okay, That window of time, getting ready early enough and being able to control it so that you're waiting for the ball is money. Yeah. So we'll be sure to drop that app in the okay. show notes um, on the show. But okay. can you tell everybody how they can find it? Yeah, it's on the App Store. On the, um, uh, it's, it's available for iPhones and iPads right now. It'll be available for Android soon. But right now it's just iPhones and iPads, and you get it on the App Store. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, man. Well, I hope that more people, when they see this podcast, they start to consider the scientific method of actually being open-minded, actually testing it, and giving HLP a shot. Yeah. yeah. I think the video is the – I mean, beyond – before game success, the video is the referee. Yeah. When, when you've got a theory and you think it will work and you work to develop that, and when you take video of your swing – and you put it side by side with Manny or Barry or Albert or Ted or Mickey or Mike, yeah. and it looks the same. You're in you're in the ballpark. Yeah, you're right where you're you finally should be. On You've the now way. scientifically proven, maybe not proven, yeah. but it's very close. And the other guys just hold up the the laptop and say, "Well, your numbers are good." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, I I think that the the ability to actually have the ability to swing at ball release was probably the most important factor in my training. Yeah. I never had it. No. And I, I could feel the rush that I would have every time. And it, I felt like I could outmatch him yeah. every single time until I got up there. And once I saw 90 to 95, it felt different. Every five miles an hour changed the game. Yeah. Point. It's different, but it's the same. When you pull a slingshot back, you can release it whenever you need to. Yeah. And when you're in a, a similar loaded position in, in, a, in a batting situation, yeah. And you can just release it whenever you want to. It's magical. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a game changer. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you having, or, uh, having you on the show, man. It was, it was great to have you, and I'm excited to be here with you. Um, and it was awesome being able to watch you work with Aaron Judge finally. Thank that was you. was cool, man. Thank I've you. been watching your videos for years. So Good to be um, here. You're doing outstanding yeah. work here. I'm impressed with your strength and conditioning knowledge. Thank you. And I'm really thankful that you're on the HLP and you're all over it. Awesome. Every video I see of you, I like. Awesome.